Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Andy. I'm chief architect, as, as Mark said. And I work at EasyJet, which is a fairly challenging business in a challenging industry. I often think of um, the airline business as a bit like the British weather, right? It's uh, characterized by basically continual inclements with periods of occasional and very unstable calm. You know, we've just been through a recession, then we had uh, the worst snow for 40 years, then we had an ash cloud. Cracky, you know, what else can be around the corner to challenge us? So I'm here today to talk about real-world IT and what we do at EasyJet. Um, one of the things I'm quite lucky with is that I don't have to, uh, I don't have to introduce our company. Um, most of you know what we do, and hopefully some of you have flown with us. But um, when I say EasyJet IT, I'm guessing some of you, some of you out there, are thinking, EasyJet IT, what's that one guy with a laptop in a tin shed by a runway on a shoestring budget? Well, it uh, isn't quite that. It's 65 people, and it's in this giant tin shed, and it's uh, by that runway. <laughs> and we run on that shoestring budget. Um, and I'm going to pause on this. This is a, a statistic. Your IT budget is a percentage of revenue. I'm going to pause on this, because I know somewhere out there my account team is sitting. Uh, and this is a tiny, tiny figure. This isn't just lean or tight. This is industry leading. This is 0.75% of revenue. I'm going to put this in perspective. I know some of you are probably struggling with the numbers a bit. So let's just say you had an e-commerce company. It's a pretty successful e-commerce company. It takes a million pounds a year. You're totally dependent on IT for everything you do. Your website, your operations, the way you take your payments, your back office, your front office. You do all of that successfully, if you're EasyJet, for seven and a half thousand pounds. That's staggering. I mean, I work there, and I think it's staggering. We're a European airline. Um, European, we're kind of pushing the boundaries of that, even by Eurovision Song Contest definition. We're kind of on the edge of that. But we fly 45 million people around every year. And we do that by making 1,000 flights a day with 200 aircraft. It's quite a logistical exercise. We're UK's largest airline and we're the, biggest, or we're the third largest in Europe. But we're also a high growth company. Now, I don't know, I don't know what high growth means to you or your customers or people you deal with. Maybe it's three, four, five years of growth. Maybe you push the boat at seven, eight. Try 12 years of growth. That's what I'm faced with. That's what drives my business. 12 years driven by, get this, an Airbus contract we signed in 2001. That ensures we get a new Airbus every two weeks and have done for the last eight years. These things are like $30 million. You have to find a crew for them. You have to find places to fly them. You have to fill them with people. That's quite a driver, and that drives everything we do. And, you know, we're a pretty sustainable business. I don't know if you can spot the recession in those figures. I can't. That's why we're the only airline that made a profit in Europe last year. I'm not giving away any company secrets here. I think if you drew a straight line through there, you'll pretty much see where 2010's headed. So I'm telling you this, not just because it's interesting, it is interesting, not just to me, but uh, really to give you some context about how we do IT, because it's very important. When you're running a, a three billion pound company that's high growth, and you've got just 65 people running the IT, you have to do things a bit differently. And I think the way we do things is kind of how a lot of companies will be doing things soon, not just now, but maybe just in the, in, in the near future. You have to have smart people, and every one of them has to count. You have to concentrate on what makes you different. You have to work with partners, and I'm glad to say Microsoft are a big part in this, who do clever things with everyday technology. And I say everyday, not just because, uh, as any kind of insult, everyday for us, because leading edge, that means complexity, and complexity is the enemy of low cost. So we take our 65 people, and we take our teeny, tiny budget, and we concentrate on the things that make EasyJet different, and we try and understand and capitalize on those things. Now, what makes EasyJet different? The secret source that drives us? But, you know, that's, that's really what's important to us. And, you know, let's face it, Microsoft Exchange, God love it. I'm sure 
it will have plenty of bells and whistles on the new version. And I know you're polishing those bells and shining up those whistles already for Wave 14. But it's not going to make EasyJet a better airline. What's going to make EasyJet a better airline are the airline and airport systems that drive us. And you've got a part to play in that. So how important is IT? It turns out to be pretty darn important to us. We have a website. The website drives pretty much our entire revenue stream. That's 2 million unique visitors every day coming in and buying flights and other products. 2 million unique visitors puts us in the top 20, sometimes the top 10 e-commerce retail sites in Europe. That's pretty amazing, right? An airline from Luton in the top 20 e-commerce sites in Europe. I mean, ahead of us, there's just the big guys. There's the Tesco's and the Argos and the Amazons of this world. Quite surprising. And in January, when we have our busiest period, everyone comes to our site and they buy their holidays, so it's generally we have two weeks of kind of mad trading. We're doing a million pounds every 20 minutes. We're filling a plane every six seconds. Now just think about that for a moment. 140 people every six seconds. They come to our site, they put in where they want to go, when they want to go. They choose from a calendar availability of 30 dates and prices. They then take a personalized insurance quote or not. They then look at a hotel from our, uh, um, a real-time fee from our hotel partner. They might consider a, a hire car from a real-time fee, fee from our hire car partner. They'll then confirm all those details, process their credit card, get a transaction, and we do that 140 times every six seconds throughout that period. That's why I think we have got, at the heart of that, one of the busiest commercial databases in Western Europe. I'm pleased to say it runs Microsoft SQL Server 2005. Now, that would have been so much better if I'd said 2008, right? But, so, you can't have everything. Maybe next time. But hey, that's the, that's the obvious side of EasyJet. Um, the website, you kind of think about. I'm really here to talk about airports. Airports, you know, I, I want to tell you a bit more about it and the challenge we face, because they're really, really challenging environments. They say if you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. Every one of our 120 are different. And how important is IT to an airport? Well, look at this. This is Bristol Airport. Uh, it's a big-ish airport for us, six, seven flights an hour from there. And if you were arriving for your journey at Bristol on this day, you'd be pretty happy. You're going to walk through that little customer wrap run. You're going to be up at the check-in desk and you are pretty much going to be on your way to a perfectly on-time and punctual EasyJet flight. Be a great experience, and maybe you'll tell a friend about it, right? Well, uh, Bristol being important to us has two network links, a backup and a, a primary and a backup, uh, which sounds great, right? It sounds perfect. What could go wrong? Well, this is Bristol in a total network failure. This is 45 minutes into those two network links both being unavailable. Now, I can't really count that number, but I can do my maths for six or seven flights in an hour, 140 people. That's probably less than 1,000 people. 1,000 people here who really, really hate EasyJet right now. And I don't know whether you know this, but people who are annoyed, they talk more to people than people who are happy. And uh, those 1,000 people, they'll go and tell 10 of their friends. And we've got 10,000 people now who are going to go out of their way not to travel on EasyJet. No matter how much I talk to them about my teeny tiny budget and get out my great PowerPoint, they're not going on EasyJet. 10,000 people because of one hour's network failure. That is dependency on IT. But times are changing. This is our EcoJet. Um, it doesn't exist, obviously. We just used this project to challenge, uh, to challenge Airbus and Boeing into trying to try and think differently about passenger aircraft, because we think there are ways of designing aircraft. Even in other areas of EasyJet, we try and be innovative and challenging. Times are changing. Airports are kind of odd. They're strange to me. I, I, I wonder about this all the time. They take a long time to plan. They put enormous amounts of time and money into building them, sometimes with some quite startling results. I don't know about you, my experience of airports tends to be completely different. It tends to be this kind of thing. The difference from the vision is miles away. And airports are a monopoly. Think about it for a moment. You know, we have this discussion. Airports say, you don't like our rules? Well, you find another airport to fly to in this city. Oh, there aren't any. Let's get back to our rules. That's how it works. You combine that with the challenges that the airports have to provide infrastructure and technology for lowest common denominator airlines. 
all the airlines, and you see some of the challenges we're up against. So uh, you see these structures, you see this investment, and you think, well, at the center of that, there must be some really good IT, right? There must be some fantastic stuff driving all that. Such efficiency. Well, there it is. Yep, that's called a cute terminal. Great name. Common user terminal emulator. It's essentially a VT100. Anyone older, than, younger than age of 30 don't know what I'm talking about now. It's a VT100 terminal. Um, and next to it, there's a couple of printers, one for printing your bag tag, one for printing your boarding pass. And it doesn't matter whether you need all this stuff, whether it works for you. You've got to pay for that. If you don't want to pay for it, let's go back to our rule book. And um, it's pretty limited in what we can do. And get this, we pay for every character you type. Every character. What a crazy world that is. You know, this is high tech if the year's 1976. So here we are. It costs less to be John Lee than it does to be Yohamid Kawasaki. You know, it's just, you know, short names cost less. What a crazy world we live in. This is the challenge I face. But what if we could challenge this? What if there was a different way? And we think there is. We think it's worth looking at this. This is our ideas for a low-cost terminal, where companies like EasyJet and other low-cost carriers don't have to put up with some of the rubbish technology that we are currently hampered with. We think if you came to somewhere like this and you could go to a self-service kiosk to get anything if you'd last minute need to purchase, we think if a meet or greeter came to you and they came to you with a handheld that maybe they could process you and they saw you on your way, then that would be a great thing, right? You could put your bag on a rotary carousel, something that's far less complex than, than, the, than the bag drops you see. Just think about what that might mean for you as an experience. Someone comes to you, they see you on your way with a simple scan, and away you go. You've had a better journey, we've saved money, it's a win-win experience. Maybe you'll even go ten of your, tell 10 of your friends. Well, that's why we're developing what we call the Halo platform. These handheld devices here are already in use in four airports in Europe where we're trialing boarding people. And by the end of the year, we'll be checking people in and processing their bags as well. This Motorola device, I'm pleased to say, is running Windows Mobile, and it's connecting to our back-end reservation system using Windows Azure Service Bus. This game-changing device is using your technology. How cool is that? <laughs> ka -ching. We are going to challenge the airline world. We are going to do this. We're going to challenge 30 years of lack of innovation. Imagine that, 30 years with the same technology. We're going to do this, and we're going to put Microsoft technology at the, at the heart of it. So I'm going to ask you a couple of things. How can Microsoft help me or help EasyJet? You know, I'm going to come to an event like this. I'm bound to ask for something, right? Well, first of all, let's talk about Windows Phone 7. I'm sure you're all very excited about Windows Phone 7. You're all getting ready to PowerPoint it and roadshow it, and you're going to get all excited about the free devices you get. I hear it's very good. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Hint, hint. Um, however. <laughs> Don't forget the enterprise, right? There's a consumer focus on, pho on Phone 7. Don't forget the enterprise, because God knows the enterprise needs good mobile products. Yes, we've developed on mobile 6.1 and 6.5, but it's a struggle, and we need good products. We need products maybe with a bigger screen, with more real estate to do stuff, maybe with finger-friendly touch screens, maybe with a long battery life. Maybe it costs 500 bucks. Oh, hang on. Right. We need good tablet devices. Don't forget that. I want to be coming back here and not having to face you trying to launch Windows Tablet 8 or whatever it will be called, facing another underdog battle. I want my tablets. Secondly, thank you. Secondly, there's this thing. It's, it's called Windows Azure. Some of you might not have heard of it, uh, mainly because for some reason the Americans call it Windows Azure. I don't know what that's all about. Um, now, I'm not melodramatic. However, this is the future of your company. This is the single most important thing you're working on right now. Azure is going to allow companies like EasyJet to do stuff that we really need to in terms of extending outside of our enterprise into the cloud. It's going to allow us to keep our current investments. We spent 10 years building up in Microsoft products. It's going to allow us to keep our people, our skills, and it's going to allow us to do some really cool things. I know right now, 
You're all sitting on top of your Windows 7 and Office cash mountains, looking down at those guys in the Azure Valley, going, you must be crazy, Andy. What do you mean? But it is. It is the future. And this is your game changer. So just to finish off, uh, Gordon used my quote earlier, which I was a bit disappointed about. Um, predicting the future. We are notoriously bad at predicting the future. And I say we, not just IT, generally we're very, very bad at it. We overpredict the big things, we underpredict the little things. You know, we all think flying cars will be here in 20 years, and they never are. And yet we can replace broadcast television with YouTube in four years. You know, if you think I'm joking, go and talk to a 15 year old and ask them what they watch more of. So, five years ago, if I'd come here and tried to talk to you about interesting stuff you could do with airports, I'm not sure there was anything to say. I'm not sure where I could innovate. But right now, right now, we're on the verge of being able to change the passenger experience forever. And we're going to do that, and we're going to be effective with it by putting Windows Mobile and Windows Azure at the heart of it. Thank you very much.